May the words on our lips and the meditations upon our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I find that the selection from Mark's Gospel this morning leaves me wanting just a little bit more context. Because as, I, as it stands, as we have it, I'm uncertain what the overall tone is. On one hand, I hear Jesus being pretty serious, but then on the other hand, what's going on with James and John and, and the rest of the disciples seems to be almost at times bordering on comical, like something out of um, the Keystone Cops. Like I just don't understand the seeming disconnect between them. Because right out of the gates, we get James and John coming to Jesus with what has to be one of the most audacious requests we can imagine. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Like, who, who says that? Right? I, I, I almost imagine like when I was 10 years old and, and we realized the way to um, outsmart the genie question that we would uh, ask for infinite wishes, and it's all set. And then, of course, the other 10, when they hear this audacious request, and even more when they hear the follow-up request, which is that James and John will be given the privileged seats in the kingdom, they also get very angry. And it seems that, at least in part, the reason they're upset is not about the audacity of that request, but the fact that James and John beat them to it. They had their own ideas, it seems, on what the seating arrangement in God's kingdom should be. So without any more context, I'm, I'm not sure am I supposed to laugh or cry. But if we step back just three verses, I think we do get a little helpful context. We see that Jesus and his followers are on the road to Jerusalem, and now they're getting very close. And it says that those who were following Jesus were amazed and they were afraid. This is a very tense moment. It's this moment where Jesus, um, they're full of expectation, um, but also a lot of dread. And it's in this moment that Jesus uh, takes the 12 aside and he reminds them one more time what to expect when they finally re reach Jerusalem. And he tells them for the third time that he will be crucified and resurrected. Only this time, he's very explicit in the details, saying that he will be mocked, spit on, flogged, killed, and in three days, rise again. That's a lot to process. But when I read the words of John and James through that lens of fear, I find I'm much more empathic with their request. I know that in times in my own life when I've been really afraid, I find comfort in the familiar. I cling to those things that I know, those things that help me feel like I'm moored and secured. It makes sense that they're still trying to fit what Jesus is saying within their own framework of expectation. They trust that he's the Messiah and that he's going to restore Israel. They expect this journey to end in triumph and victory. What Jesus is saying does not fit with anything they've come to expect, and it certainly isn't comforting. And considering that, I think it's also easier for me, at least, to empathize with their reluctance to embrace the full gravity of Jesus' counter question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Of course, we, the hearers of the story, know that the cup and the baptism that Jesus is speaking of refers to his suffering and his death. And considering that Jesus has just laid this out for every one of them, I suspect that at least on some level, James and John understand that as well. I suspect that it's not so much that they're really oblivious to what Jesus is saying, 
but they just really don't want to hear it. They're still clinging to some hope that maybe Jesus doesn't really mean that, and that things are going to play out according to their expectations. Because let's be honest, what Jesus is saying is hard. Saying that the path he is on is a way of suffering, and anyone who wants to share in that glory needs to be ready to walk in that way as well. That's not an easy teaching, and in fact, it seems, at least on the face value, to cut against every one of our most basic instincts for self-preservation. So what is it that he's suggesting exactly? Is he suggesting that suffering is a good thing, that we're supposed to seek it out? Are, are, are we doing it wrong when we come together and pray for comfort from pain and, and for healing for ourselves and our loved ones? Is martyrdom the only true expression of faith? Well, no. I don't believe that Jesus is saying anything like that. Jesus is not holding up suffering for suffering's sake as a good that we should seek. And if that weren't clear by the way he has been spending his time healing and feeding, we're reminded again today in his statement, the statement that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now for me, that word ransom has been a bit of a stumbling block, because I know when I hear it, my mind immediately goes to stories about hostage situations or kidnappings, right? Like, give me a million dollars or else. But the Greek is a little more nuanced. It's the act, which is often, but not necessarily a payment, that sets a slave free from their sentence of servitude. The emphasis isn't on the cost, but on what it accomplishes. And what it accomplishes is setting loose and freeing. So Jesus is saying that his life is a self-offering meant to liberate. And I think that's what we hear in John's gospel, in the same, the same idea expressed in Jesus' words, that he came that we might have life and have it in abundance. Jesus does not drink this cup of suffering so that we might wallow together in suffering, but so that in it we might find new life. And this cup of suffering that Jesus accepts is ultimately the common cup of our humanity. You will drink from this cup, he tells James and John. And how can they not? No one ultimately gets to avoid this cup. And by drinking of this cup, Jesus has demonstrated for us that our suffering does not represent the negation of God's promises to us, but there is actually truly nowhere that we can go that God is not present. And if we're willing to follow Jesus on this path, we find that suffering is a door to love. First, there is nothing like suffering to help us quickly and decisively separate the wheat from the chaff, what matters and what doesn't in life. And second, it is in our suffering that we find that the walls and barriers that we create between us are imaginary lines in the sand. Pain is a language that connects us all. When my pain touches your pain, I recognize you in me and me in you. And in Jesus, it connects us with God. And if we're able to follow in Jesus' pattern of self-emptying, where it's not all about me, we find that it isn't so much my pain, it is the pain. And this doesn't make it less painful, and it certainly doesn't make it something that now we're going to go seek out. In fact, far from it. But now it's not enough to simply seek my own comfort. And I find a new strength to not just be reactive to the pain, but to be responsive, to seek not just my own liberation, but to desire liberation for you, because my liberation is tied up in the liberation of all. 
It's not somehow that we're wrong for wanting the good in life. The problem is when in our fear, we would come to try to hoard it, seeing it as maybe scarce, and inevitably in our attempt to get as much for ourselves, we have to be constantly pushing others away. And that's the root of this dynamic that Jesus speaks of when he talks about those Gentile rulers who seek power for themselves and lord it over others, ultimately through intimidation and force. But it is not to be that way with us. It is not to be that way with those who follow Jesus. For those who have tasted in his cup not just the bitterness of pain, but the richness of compassion and the promise of new and everlasting life. Amen.